morning everyone many of you know the global health network really well some of you will be new too but we've got a couple of new programs that i really want to um tell you about including the diploma and i think next year we need a whole section just for the diploma um but the big news since we spoke last is that the global health network is now a who collaborating center um which i'll talk more about um which is super exciting um there's a few in oxford um but we're a collaborating center with a science division um which used to be with uh, Sam and Nathan, now with a certain Jeremy Farrow, I think a few of us remember him, but it was before that happened. Um, and I think the whole idea really is to try and uh, really get research to places where research isn't happening. And in doing that, trying to really take the best uh, methods that could possibly work in that setting and, and often adapt the really like seemingly scary and off-putting things like federated analysis and make it really practical and applicable in, in many different settings. Um, you know, we all know that we're all working to try and address the gap in research equity, and I know there's a whole session on equity later, um, and I'll talk about our diploma, which we hope um, is making some inroads on that. But basically, all the Global Health Network does is move knowledge, is move information, and we do that in person and online. We have this sort of underpinning tenant as well, that um, every disease needs to have every type of research happen. Um, we're doing a lot of work this week, which I'll talk about in a minute, with the World Health Organization and the WHA uh, resolution on clinical trials, which is excellent. But clinical trials don't happen in isolation. You know, to run a study, a clinical trial anywhere, you need epidemiology to understand the burden of disease. You need social science to uh, really understand the context. And, the, and obviously, everything from diagnosis to genomics, modeling, we'll hear about all the work we all do. Um, these are connected in an ecosystem. We've also done a lot of work to understand the barriers uh, to undertaking any of these types of uh, health research studies, and, and they really don't differ. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're working on dengue in Nepal or leishmaniasis um, in Africa, um, the barriers that you need to overcome to do research in that workplace are really the same. Um, and so lots of the old ways of delivering research capacity just didn't work because they were often teaching people just to run one study in one setting and teach them the same old, same olds, um, but really to get some data often for another group. So what we're trying to do is, is put research systems in health systems, and this connects up beautifully, obviously, with uh, health systems work here and, and, and a lot of the groups across um, what we're, we're doing in Oxford in global health is really trying to connect up lots of these pieces. And so the Global Health Network's role in that, I hope, is to try and um, embed the skills and the resources and the mechanisms for, for doing that. So have a hunt around on the platform. And, and the, the idea is that across the different topics and, and groups within there, you can find all the different component um, training resources, skills, people who can help you um, and, and the teams that you work with. And, and, and obviously our actual target audience is, is groups where they don't have a big uh, Welcome Oxford program around them. And they're trying to run studies um, by themselves in in somewhere that doesn't have that support network and i often describe it as trying to have um you know researchers somewhere like colombia or or peru can access exactly the same standard of information tools training knowledge as somebody sat in oxford or harvard or even the kemri welcome program in in Kilifi. um and so that's the real uh goal is to try and um, support people whilst they're running studies to get the um the tools and resources that they need this has been running for nearly 15 years now. Mike, when was I in Khalifi? A long time ago. Um, when I was working with um, Kevin and many of you in the room um, in Khalifi back in the day, um, we were working to try and solve lots of these problems, particularly across Africa as the, globe, as the um, EDCTP networks of excellence were going. And so this began as a very small um, idea. We're just trying to create access to protocols and SOPs and things. But over the years, it's grown. And we now have 60 different interconnected communities of practice. Um, Adam, who I did see somewhere, um, looks after um, these uh, communities. Um, and we have all these different types of um, topics, disease areas, and cross-cutting themes like um, community engagement, social science, but also disease topics too. And so those are run by organizations like WHO, CEPI, um, many of the big NIH funded group say and so they all have their own particular topic within the wider topic of global health research and so those groups are all using the global health network as their mechanism for sharing their knowledge and information and working with their teams but the real um exciting piece is we have literally hundreds of thousands of uh, research workers lab staff 
community health workers, nurses, doctors, policymakers who come in their thousands to access those tools and resources. And that's why I keep saying all we're doing really is mobilising knowledge in between the two. Um, and we do a lot of work um, with the WHO across different areas. And that's what's really helped us um, bring this together in this, in this really large connected platform. We've done a lot of thinking on the last few years about the governance and structure because it's great sitting in Oxford and being an Oxford entity and that's very important for, for sometimes for, um, for students they like to have that um, Oxford uh, clarity or, or external partners as well but we're all working really hard to take Oxford out more and be and, and have that more equitable approach. And, and really for the Global Health Network, we don't want it to be a kind of Oxford thing. Um, and so we've set this up as a global franchise and we have uh, collaborating centres in Africa, Asia and Latin America and soon adding MENA, aren't we, Salvia? Which is very exciting. So the Middle East and North Africa region, really for the Arabic speaking nations. So funding can go directly to all of these partners now. And, and our recent award we've just got from Welcome, we've got six partners, seven partners across Latin America. And the grant is going literally, there's no lead PI and there's no lead institution. It's proper um, team science. And um, that grant will be going equally across all of those institutions. And many um, of our partners um, will apply for a grant as the Global Health Network, Ghana or um, Malaysia or wherever they're going to be. Um, certainly the MENA region are taking this approach and the funding can go directly to them. And uh, we are representing the global operations team, but even we're not solely based in Oxford anymore and we have colleagues um, around the globe and it really does work well on this um, really trying to create this equity into where research funding goes. Um, so just as an example this is what's happening in Africa we work with Africa CDC and AMREF um, we've got MOUs with all these different organizations and all the dots are individuals and these are as colleagues that are employed as the global health network coordinator for different topics so we work with IDRC for example um, and they, uh, we're running a program on AI with them, and we have four coordinators across Africa who are working to, to connect up and do capacity building in um, in AI in healthcare. Um, and that is the model that we roll for all those different topics. Um, and that means we can have this really nice footprint on the ground where we can deliver um, things like research clubs and and, um, and and workshops in in the workplace um, and any of those. Uh, teams that we have in, employed under that particular role can also turn their hand to any of the other topics we want to deliver. And this is the same across the other regions too. So people come because they want to find these training courses. We've got professional development scheme, many of you know about already. And, and all of these largely now are driven by our partners who, who contribute the content um, onto the training. But this could also be delivered um, in person across that regional network that, um, that we've just described. The idea is that um, it's it's like a journey of, of, to impact. So nobody really comes to the Global Health Network once and just does a GCP course, but we build this relationship with with our community over many years, literally many years now. Um, and the idea is that um, you know they can come and find a piece of training. They might connect up with others. They might form a, a, a working group and run a particular study. They might come back and do a workshop. And it's this really sequential learning over time. And, and we divide everything up around this sort of core set of, of skills that we want to impart and apply that to whatever disease is appropriate. So this, this graph really shows how that can happen for, uh, for any one individual, but it could also happen for a team or even a whole program. Um, and, and it's a sort of long term slow but really building um set of experience so um a lab in ghana for example um has has worked with us for many years um and they have all of their nice certificates in their in their labs training teams but they means that they can attack um attract funding from um outside partners and workers um research centers for other groups um but they've been you know, using this all to also apply for grants or to find another assay with another colleague. And then when COVID came along, we connected up um, with lots of groups to work with other programs so they could run the disease characterization protocols. So it's all this sort of long term connecting up that's really, really impactful over time. I just quickly want to mention this new initiative we've got because it might be something that um, many of you could take on um, and think about um, whether it would be a useful thing in your in your work. Um, so we work with the WHO, it's a 75 year um, anniversary and they wanted to have leadership challenges. So we were thinking about how we could use this with, with lots of the work we do. And we came up with trying to work with um, nurses, midwives, allied health workers, community health workers, 
you know, those that workforce at the front line that really can be taking up a leadership role in research, but are often kind of at the bottom of the pyramid um, and, and, and often don't get that opportunity or they do research and then they don't really have um, the opportunity to really um, be recognised for that or step up. And so the Thousand Challenge is going to be launched um, later this month, hopefully, um, and will be a system that will take um, teams through that process. It helps them set the question, work out what they're going to measure, and, and then capture the data, report it, and take those findings up into practice. And every single step of the way, they're offered help and support, either with resources we have already, or we'll also set up support groups for each of these studies, um, so each of those steps they need. So they might need different people over the course of the time. They might need help setting up REDCap, or they might need help going to their, their employers and asking, um, you know, to, even permission to do the studies. Um, a couple of quick examples, we've been talking to groups in Nepal who want to go into the community um, and look at some mental health um, uh, processes they've been doing for a long time. You know, maybe they're running support groups or mentorship schemes in the community, but they don't know it works and they've never measured it. So it's a really straightforward, practical piece of work where we can assess, um, you know, whether or not it's having an impact on the community and work with them to work out what they'd measure to show whether that works or not. So there's just, you know, there's a hundred million ideas of things that could be applied to this. And the point is, it's just um, a support system that takes them through the process of running a good study, but makes it visible. It's under the Thousand Challenge banner. It's a WHO initiative. We're trying to persuade Tedros to give the Tedros Prize for uh, various elements of it. Thank you, SAS, for the idea on prizes. Um, Another example is our colleague Mama Vua in uh, Kilifi, who's, who's done a really nice piece of work over many years with the colleagues on the ward there. Um, and she described this to us as an audit, which um, it could be described as an audit, but it was a really nice, high quality piece of work that changed the practice on the ward. So that's a great example of a thousand challenge that we should, we're gonna use this actually as an example to test the system. Um, I just quickly want to explain um, one of the latest sort of innovations that we're able to do with the Global Health Network, which is to be a research platform in its own right. So this is a piece of work we've just done with Welcome. So I can't share these slides, but I'm happy to just show the sort of big, uh, big sort of headline outcome. Um, Welcome wanted us to work with them rather than run a meeting in the Euston Road to say, um, where should we be funding our infectious disease um, grants? And so we work, they work with us and we, we run this nice process, it's like a kind of crowd Delphi. Um, we had um, 3,700 respondents from across the global south, um, and, it, the, and the questions were really clear. What infectious diseases do you think are at the highest threat of escalation? What sort of research should be being done? And what are the barriers to doing that research? Um, the big uh, message was that, uh, that we've got the arboviruses and uh, the really vector-borne diseases off the scale when we group those together um, are seen as the biggest threat in the global south. Um, compared to the more sort of respiratory infections um, in the global north and a very different picture depending where you are in the world and actually quite a different picture than many of the funders are actually wanting to fund so we were delighted with these uh, results um, and for my colleagues for the Africa uh, you know still keeping malaria obviously um, on the on the dashboard there and the driver for that when we ran in when we looked into the um, into the to the data which we pushed into, we took this to workshops. So we did a big survey and then we did three workshops around the globe and said, why, you know, tell us the context. And it was climate change and the movement of vectors. So not necessarily a surprise, but a very strong body of robust evidence to explain that. And so this is how it looks when you look at the difference between the high um, and low income countries. So this is a draft report at the moment. So I just wanted to show it to you because it's quite interesting. Um, I'll just click forward a bit on this, but this is, um, we've also just repeated um, this methodology for the WHO. It's being presented today um, by um, by Vasi and I think Jeremy at a uh, PAHO meeting. Um, this isn't their slide, but this is, um, the nice thing is, is you can almost overlay it because the, the work we've just done with WHO was to ask about the WHA uh, trials resolution that's got, gone out and, and WHO are charged with implementing it. And we've done a piece of research for them to ask what the barriers are and what the perceptions are about implementing the WHA trials resolution. And we almost had exact same picture come through, um, similar number of respondents, a different audience, but they were all saying that uh, with agreement about um, institutional support, but obviously research training, because that's what we do, but institutional report, uh, community engagement, access to funding, but 
really working in in communities and networks is really vital. So we we're very um, pleased to get this evidence. Um, just to finish off, um, this is really exciting. It's a great week to be presenting this. We have our first cohort of students this week, Oxford's first entirely distant uh, qualification. It took seven years to get it through the system in Oxford. Um, and our target audience are uh, people that are already working in research in the workplace, but for social, economic, um, whatever reasons, they can't come to Oxford. And so this is all about uh, creating some equity and who can access an Oxford qualification. Um, and so this course is based on the essential curricula, which was the diagram I showed you right at the beginning, which was a study from the same methodology I just described. Um, and that's where we set out the essential curricula for health research. So this diploma will take students through um, uh, this whole um, set of uh, learnings and hopefully equip them to, to really design and lead and run their own studies. And we really appreciate the support of AFOX as well, having some scholars through um, for this. Um, and we, we may even think about taking this up into a master's and also following with other similar courses um, in this with this online approach. It's, it's, it hasn't been easy because it's Oxford's first. <laughs> So you can imagine, but um, we're really proud and really excited. Um, we're also quite keen, if anybody's interested in doing some teaching or helping with exam boards, um, tutors, it's it's a really nice one to get involved with. It's not a huge workload and we really want to involve lots of people and also students for next year, just selling that out there. Um, so this is really what we do to try and um, really create some of that equity. Um, and hopefully this sort of workplace ethos is really impacting some of the sustainable development goals.